Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to review for the second exam. And I want to remind you ab about studying, that the generally repetition, the more time you spend going over these things, the more you will remember. And also to choose active methods, like taking notes, or practicing quizzing, or making a review sheet, or a concept map, or writing de definitions. Those are all active methods, and doing them will help you remember things. So plan your time, take breaks, work in short bits. That will all help, and uh, well, good luck. Okay, so this exam is basically chapters 5, 6, 9, and 10, with probably the greatest emphasis on... Um, 5, 6, and 10, with a little bit of 9 and 11 in there. Concentrate on general functions of organ systems, on their physiology, how they work, um, any kind of link they have to homeostasis, how they develop, and disorders. Look over summaries, look over bold terms, use your textbook, uh, any kind of things on Moodle, like the PowerPoint presentations, the lists of keywords, your old quizzes, those are all good things to look at. Let's go over some of these things. Again, general functions of organ systems are important. So for the skin or integument, we're talking about protection against abrasion, ultraviolet light, water loss, uh, protection against microorganisms. The skin is a, a big sensory organ, contains many sensory receptors for heat, cold, touch, pressure, pain, the skin is a primary sense, general sense organ. Uh, the skin is also involved in homeostasis through its role in temperature regulation. The activity of the sweat glands and the control of blood through the skin are important ways to increase or reduce heat loss. The skin also produces vitamin D in, when it's exposed to sunlight, and it's involved in excretion. The layers of the skin, there's two, two main layers, the epidermis, made up of stratified squamous epithelial cells on top. Then the dermis, which is made up of fibrous connective tissue. Uh, it's dense, irregular fibrous connective tissue and contains things like blood vessels, nerve cells, sensory cells, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, erector pili muscles. Okay, so lots of stuff there. Uh, we talked a lot about the role in, of skin in skin color in protection against ultraviolet light and melanin. Okay, the cells that produce the pigment melanin are called melanosomes. They produce it in the stratum basal, the basement layer of the epidermis, and then they transfer it to other cells, to the keratinocytes, through little melanosomes, little vesicles that contain melanin. So the color becomes spread throughout all cells, but it's made by only the melanosome sites. Okay, the role of the skin in temperature regulation uh, is due to the eccrine sweat glands producing a watery fluid that evaporates from the skin surface. That takes lots of heat. And then the other main uh, way we control temperature loss is by controlling blood flow. And so when we increase the amount of blood flow to the surface of the skin, we increase heat loss. When we want to conserve heat, we reduce blood flow near the surface. Okay, and then we talked about several types of disorders of the skin, most commonly the skin cancers. Skin cancers are the most common cancers among Americans. There's millions of new cases diagnosed every year. Okay, most of those are treatable and are not going to be fatal. Melanoma is the least common, but the most serious. That kills about 8,000 Americans a year. Okay, this is all ultraviolet exposure. Okay, and, and so ultraviolet damages DNA. If it damages the genes that are involved in mitosis, it can lead to skin cancer. People with more melanin are less susceptible. Okay. All right, let's go to the skeletal system. So functions of the skeletal system. Um, the bones are going to provide support. They're going to provide protection. They are the uh, levers which produce movement when muscles act upon them. 
They store calcium, phosphate, and fat, and they're involved in blood cell production. Okay, the structure of a long bone, um, the bone contains a, a hollow shaft called the diaphysis. And then at either end where it articulates with other bones, there is an epiphysis that's reinforced with spongy bone. Okay, the periosteum is a fibrous membrane that surrounds the entire surface of the bone except the heads of the epiphysis. It contains lots of the cells for repair of fractures and depositing new bones. The epiphyses are covered by articular cartilages. In the shaft of the di diaphysis is the medullary cavity and that contains yellow marrow, fat. The spaces in spongy bone will contain red marrow and that's where blood cells are produced. Um, and so compact spongy bones. The growing and length of the bone occurs at the epiphyseal disc, which eventually is replaced by an epiphyseal line. Okay, in cartilage bones then, the formation happens with primary and secondary ossification centers. It's first the bone is first formed as a cartilage model, and then bony cells replace the cartilage. Those are osteoblasts. And eventually, at what's left is an epiphyseal plate, which is a cartilage plate where growth occurs. Membrane bones form differently in the embryo. They form in a connective tissue layer below the skin. Uh, osteoblasts initially form trabeculae, spongy bone, and then compact bone is deposited around the edges of that. And this bone continues to grow at the edges. Okay, the big role of the skeletal system in homeostasis is in calcium homeostasis. Calcium is really important for nerve and muscle cells. And so the, the body maintains steady, steady levels of calcium in the blood. There are two glands that are involved in this, calcitonin, or uh, the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland. The thyroid gland secretes calcitonin when calcium levels are above normal and that causes bone deposition and allows uh, a reduction in the uptake of calcium in the intestine and a decrease in calcium reabsorption from the urine. If calcium levels fall below normal, Okay, then the parathyroid hormone or a parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone. That releases, causes osteoclast to release calcium from bone immediately, uh, boosting levels of calcium in the blood, but it also increases calcium absorption in the intestine and uh, decreases loss in the urine. Okay. Over time in older people, calcium loss may outpace calcium deposition, and this can lead to osteoporosis. This is a disease affecting primarily older adults, but it affects many, many of them, and it's a major cause of bony fractures, over 1.5 million, million per year. Okay, and so this happens in older people that have reduced growth hormone and primarily reduced sex hormones. Um, it's affected by diet, weight, exercise, uh, things like smoking and alcohol consumption interfere with calcium absorption and so can be a problem. The primary uh, people this affects are elderly women because they've completely stopped producing estrogen and that reduces the activity of the cells that deposit bone. So this leads to fractures of, of bones that can happen spontaneously and this can cause loss of height. Okay. Then, uh, let's see, we went into um, the types of joints. Okay, still part of the skeletal system, but a different thing. We have different types of joints depending on the amount of movement or on their structure. Uh, for us, we'll talk mostly about structure. We have fibrous joints like sutures or ligaments, syndesmosis, that are, are only slightly movable or almost completely immovable, and periodontal ligaments or gomphoses that hold teeth in sockets. These allow for growth so that the, the uh, structures can grow but still be held closely together. It also allows uh, them to sometimes move a little bit in case there's an impact or it has to change shape. Cartilage joints include the like the pubic symphysis or the joints between the ribs and the sternum. These are uh, synchondroses. Uh, they too have little to no movement but allow for growth or shape changes. 
Synovial joints are more complex. They contain both fibrous tissues and cartilage and allow for a large range of movement. Uh, here's a synovial joint up close. All synovial joints will contain an articular cartilage, a thick pad of cartilage covering the mobile ends of the bone. The bones will be held together uh, in a, a separate joint cavity by a fibrous capsule that surrounds the joint and creates that space. And then a synovial membrane lines the space and secretes fluid. Okay, so general functions for these joints, they permit voluntary movement, they permit growth, and they permit shape changes. Uh, this is a, an uh, infant skull. It's a good example of a shape change. As the skull passes through the birth canal, it can dramatically change shape, uh, so easing the passage, and then it allows for growth after birth. Okay, here the major uh, disorder is the arthritis, and there are several types of arthritis. Arthritis is, a, again, a huge problem for older Americans, affects as many as 40 million Americans. Uh, osteoarthritis is primarily an age injury overuse type uh, function where cartilage is starting to degenerate and is replaced by bone and inflammation. But you can also have um, rheumatoid arthritis, which is a, um, an arthritis that's generated by an autoimmune response or infectious type of arthritis. Okay, and here, in every case, there's inflammation. Uh, bone starts replacing cartilage, the joint becomes painful, swollen, and difficult to move. Okay, then we uh, covered the muscular system. This system functions to produce movement with the skeletal system. <clears throat> it also helps structures maintain position and posture, ventilates the lungs, uh, produces heat, and is involved in temperature regulation, communication, and other types of muscle do heart and organ function. Muscle cells are specialized so that they can respond to nerve cell stimulation. They can send an action potential across their surface with a sarcolemma or transverse tubule. They have a modified endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, then they are filled with myofibrils, contractile proteins. <coughs> See, to activate a muscle, muscle cell, is requires a skeletal muscle cell requires action at the neuromuscular junction. This is where a neuron meets the muscle cell membrane and releases a neurotransmitter. This is going to open ion channels and cause a depolarization. In excitation coupling, this depolarization spreads across the surface of the membrane and into transverse tubules, causing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the myofibril. Calcium allows the two filaments to interact. It, it exposes binding sites on actin so that the myosin heads can form cross bridges that pull the actin past the myosin. This requires again calcium and ATP. So muscle cells use a tremendous amount of ATP and they get it from two different types of metabolism, aerobic and anaerobic. And different types of muscle cells specialize in these different types of metabolism. For the aerobic fibers, these are fibers that have lots of mitochondria. They're supplied by blood vessels bringing oxygen and they store oxygen as myoglobin. These cells can use glucose or fat for metabolism and they are very resistant to fatigue. Essentially, they can go all day. And the muscles will appear dark red because of all these pigments. Anaerobic fibers are different. They're faster. They have faster rates of producing energy and faster rates of using energy. So their modifications are often of their myosin. Unfortunately, they use glucose at an incredible rate and they build up a waste product called lactic acid that causes muscle fatigue. So while these fibers allow you to sprint at rates that are almost twice as fast as you can get from aerobic metabolism, they're going to give out in only 20 or 30 seconds. Okay, and we talked about muscles as organs, that muscles contain skeletal muscle, but they also contain lots of connective tissues. And these connective tissues make up the attachments, complete parts of the muscle are, are just connective tissues. And of course, there's lots of blood vessels and nerves in there. 
muscles respond to nerve cells and they can respond with a single twitch contraction but they will if the nerve cell repeatedly stimulates the muscle that will cause a staircase effect or trep where the muscle will contract harder and longer with no relaxation if there's enough uh, stimulation from the nerve cell it can produce a maximal contraction called tetanus and so Units can muscle units or muscle cells can contract harder if stimulated more often. We can also activate just part of the muscle or the whole muscle, and this is called motor unit summation. So this allows us to get different forces of contraction from different skeletal muscles. Here we talked about a couple genetic diseases, which are defects in uh, these skeletal muscles that are inherited from parents. Um, we talked about muscular dystrophy and then which is a series of diseases that are muscle protein defects in the myofibrils primarily these affect boys but some will affect girls and then we also talked about autoimmunity of myasthenia gravis uh, where we have antibodies against the receptors for ACH that make it hard to activate the muscle and produce a weakness or paralysis okay we're gonna stop there uh, again these are the things to focus on. For this one, don't worry about identifying individual bones or individual joints or even individual skeletal muscles. That's lab stuff. Focus on physiology, focus on development, focus on uh, how things work in homeostasis.